All right, last unit, last review session of this format at least, uh, the nature of matter. And of course, you remember, hasn't been that long since we started that unit. We started off with an analysis of the cathode ray tube. The cathode ray tube was performed by J.J. Thompson, 1897, and really what it boiled down to is a device that was used by Thompson to discover the electron. Now, Thompson didn't invent the cathode ray tube. Lots of people had used cathode ray tubes for almost 50 years prior to Thompson, but improvements in technology led Thompson to be able to measure what we call the charge to mass ratio of these mysterious cathode rays leaving the cathode going towards the anode, which in turn led him to the discovery of the electron. I'm going to draw a little picture of this. And we'll real quickly summarize that picture. We start off with the cathode and the anode. The cathode seems kind of odd, but the cathode is the negative side, the negative side of this cathode ray tube. It's going to be right here. Okay, this is our cathode. This is our anode over here. So we get these mysterious cathode rays that are leaving the cathode going towards the anode. They go straight through because we got a hole in the anode or some way for them to make it through. They're accelerating during that portion, and then and then, once they leave the anode, then they just keep sailing along until they hit something, which ends up usually being this screen on the other side. This screen is painted with this paint that will glow, a phosphorescent paint that will glow when, a, when something like a, a beam of electron strikes it. So we're able to determine exactly where this mysterious cathode ray ends up hitting. But Thompson says, that's not good enough for me. Okay, I want to see what these mysterious cathode rays are. So he introduces over here a magnetic field. We know what's going to happen to these mysterious rays in this magnetic field, right? As it turns out, they end up curving downwards like this. This told Thompson that these particles were negatively charged particles, not subatomic, not electrons, but just negative. And how do we know that? Because negatively charged particles are deflected in that direction by a magnetic field. It's the hand rule for deflection, right? Two units ago, our review on Monday, I think it was. Thumb in the direction of the particles, fingers in the direction of the external field, palm points downward in the direction of the magnetic force. We know that negatively charged particles are deflected in this direction by a magnetic field. Now, Thompson did a little bit of an analysis of this. He said Fc is equal to Fm. Magnetic for, uh, sorry, centripetal force equals the magnetic force, or mv squared over r equals qvb. Cancels out of v. mv over r equals q times v. Not enough information, though, to really solve for anything useful here. Didn't know what M was, didn't know what V was, didn't know what Q was. He knew what B was, he knew what R was, but that wasn't really helpful because two, two givens and three unknowns is not very helpful. So then what he does is goes over here a little bit, introduces another magnetic field and an electric field. The electric field is caused by two charged parallel plates. And then he says, these particles, these mysterious negatively charged cathode rays, now we know they're negatively charged, right? These mysterious negatively charged cathode rays go through this. Some of them are deflected upwards. Some are deflected downwards, depending upon which force, the magnetic force or the electric force, is bigger. But some of them, if the forces end up balancing, those particles for which the force is balanced will end up going straight through. So we're going to look at just those particles, just the ones that have the forces balanced, just the ones that go straight through. The electric force equals the magnetic force. If you use cancel, V is equal to E over B. So Thompson now has the speed, not of all the particles, not of all them, because some of them are going a bit faster, some of them are going a bit slower, some of them will be deflected upwards, some deflected downwards. But for the ones that go straight through and make it to this third section over here, they must be going that speed. So now he knows what V is. He already knew what R was. He already knew what B was. Now he's going to turn around and take this equation that he had first and solve not for Q or M, but the charge to mass ratio, Q over M. And I don't know if you remember the value that he got or not. You don't have to. 
the value that he solved for was 1.76 times 10 to the 11 kilohms per kilogram. What was special about that number? Okay, what about this number led Thomson to the discovery of the electron? Okay, if the charge to mass ratio is really, really big, then the mass must be really, really small. If the charge to mass ratio is bigger than any other charge to mass ratio of any atom, then the mass must be smaller than the mass of any atom. And if you've got a mass smaller than the mass of an atom, then it must be a particle that's smaller than an atom, a subatomic particle. Okay, we already established that it was a negatively charged particle. Now we know that it's a negatively charged subatomic particle. There's the discovery of the electron. Now there is one more bit of analysis that I can do with this. We don't often have to do it, but from time to time we do. That's this section right here. What's happening here? Charged particles accelerate from the cathode to the anode. Well, when charged particles accelerate, we reviewed this on Monday, right? Not in this context. Okay, what do we do? EI equals EF. It's like a car going down a hill. In this case, it would be QVI equals 1F MVF squared. Now, the reason we don't usually like to use this to solve for V is because, strictly speaking, in a cathode ray tube, if we're doing a, a, a true cathode ray tube experiment to discover the electron, we don't know what Q is, we don't know what M is. So how do you solve for V if you don't know what Q is, you don't know what M is? That's why we, that's why we go into this what we call the velocity selector in order to solve for V and then plug that value into here. So here's what I want you to do. Be prepared to do this. Okay, you don't have to do it often, but it does happen from time to time. Be prepared to do this. Be prepared to do this, the velocity selector. Be prepared to do this, what I call the main chamber. And be prepared to combine them, especially these two. This happens fairly often. We have to solve for the speed using this one and plug that into the speed for this one, end up solving for the charge to mass ratio or something else. All right? Now, before we do a couple of, uh, uh, of uh, or one multiple choice question that relates to this, I want to just real quickly tell you where this led in terms of the model of the atom. Prior to this, we had the Dalton solid sphere model, right? Now we have, at least in 1897, we have the plum pudding model of the atom, which is where the atom consists of a sea of positive charge, okay, charge in the atom, but a bunch of little negative electrons floating around inside that sea of positive charge. So now there's something subatomic, smaller than the atom. All right, that's all uh, way, way far off of what we currently accept the model of the atom to look like, but it's a certainly a big step forward from the Dalton solid sphere model because now we have this idea that there's subatomic particles. Carry question. No, no. Cathode rays are beams of electrons. Okay. Now, having said that, cathode rays are beams of electrons. Just a quick little aside here that I hadn't planned on mentioning, but um, it is possible to get X-rays produced when the beams of electrons strike the screen. Okay. Why is that possible? Well, because how are X-rays produced? By rapidly decelerating electrons, right? Now, that doesn't happen in the I was going to point to the TV in the corner of the classroom. It's not there anymore. They just they took it away. Um, that doesn't happen in TVs, right? In the old style TVs. You don't get x-rays produced from your TV. But it can happen in, in cathode ray tubes where you get electrons produced, not through the cathode ray tube itself, but the, due to the collision of the electrons with the, uh, with the screen. But the cathode rays themselves, um, 1897, we didn't know what they were, but Thompson discovered that those cathode rays themselves were really beams of electrons, not gamma rays. Got it? All right, I'd like you to take a look at multiple choice question number one, please. Okay, here we go. Uh, it says, Thompson performed an experiment in 1897 that led him to be credited for the discovery of the electron. This is what we're just talking about, right? In this cathode tube experiment, he passed the mysterious cathode rays undeflected through electric and magnetic field. This tells us right now, undeflected electric and magnetic fields, that's going to be the velocity selection chamber. Okay, we don't have any data about that yet, but we know that it's the velocity selection chamber because it's A, undeflected, and B, electric and magnetic fields. He determined the charge to mass ratio, and with the charge to mass ratio, we know that's got to be what I call the main chamber, 
main chamber because uh, that's where uh, the particles go through a magnetic field and go in a circle and allow us to find the charge to mass ratio. Some students repeated this experiment, setting both magnetic fields equal to 0.3 Tesla and the electric field equal to 8.1 times 10 to the 5. Measured the radius of the path of the catheterase uh, and found it to be uh, 5.36 times 10 to the minus 5. We want to find the charge to mass ratio. So look, if we're going to find the charge to mass ratio, we're going to use that main chamber where we say Fc is equal to Fm. Or mv squared over r equals qvb. We cancel out Vs, and we're left with Q over M is equal to V over B times R. Okay, I know what B is, I know what R is, but I don't know what V is. So i got to find it some other way. Let's go back to the other little bit of stuff that I know, and that's the velocity selection chamber, which says Fe equals Fm. That is, for those particles that go undeflected, Fe equals Fm. For the other particles, that's not the case, but we don't care about those other ones. We say Qe equals QVB. Cancel that out. We solve for speed. We get E over B. And I don't know what the answer for V works out to be, but whatever it is, we plug it into here, solve for V over B times R, and we end up getting an answer for that question, a final answer of 1.7 times 10 to the 11, which we are going to express as 1711. All right, so we've discovered the electron using the charge to mass ratio in the cathode ray tube. Now let's find not the charge to mass ratio of the electron, but let's find the charge of the electron. By the way, um, miss the physics principles up here. I should have mentioned those briefly. We got three of them listed here. Sorry, four of them listed here. Uniform motion. Why? Because the charged particles go at a constant speed as they go through the velocity selection chamber, right? Constant velocity as they go through the velocity selection chamber. Accelerated motion because they're accelerating when they're going from the cathode to the anode. Uniform circular motion because they're going in a circle when they're going in the main chamber where we find the charge to mass ratio. And then finally, topic number four, principle number five, conservation of energy because we usually use EI equals EF in order to find the um, the speed as it leaves the, the anode, as it reaches the anode. Now, in a situation like this, you're not going to end up using both of these, accelerated motion and conservation of energy. You're going to usually use conservation of energy to find the speed at the anode. But if you do happen to use one of the acceleration equations, right, you didn't use both. Right? You got the speed at the anode one way or the other. So you can't say both principles, even though both principles are valid in finding the final speed, you're not going to use both of them. So you can't list both of them if you didn't use both of them. All right, the oil drop experiment, which led us to not the discovery of the electron, but led us to the charge and ultimately the mass of the electron. Millikan, the oil drop experiment, right? Um, remember, he, uh, he had this thing where he injected oil drops in between these two plates. Switch them around. Usually, I draw the positive plate at the top, negative at the bottom. Doesn't really matter, though. We get a negative at the top this time, a positive at the bottom. We have these oil droplets in between these plates, and maybe they're positive or negative already by charging by friction, rubbing against each other. Maybe we irradiate them with x-rays to ionize them, to charge them, whatever. Hey, let's assume that these oil droplets have charges. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. There's two forces acting on both of these, and don't get these mixed up with the cathode ray tube. In this case, it's the electric force upwards and the gravitational force downwards, as opposed to the cathode ray tube, which, which was electric force and magnetic force. Here we have gravitational force and electric force. Remember, you've got an electric field going upwards here, right? If it's a negative particle, the force is opposite to the field. If it's a positive particle, the force is with the field. All right, we're going to look at the particles that are suspended first or traveling at a constant speed. Suspended or traveling at a constant speed, because we do the same analysis for both of those types of uh, particles. For both of those, we're going to say Fe equals Fg. 
the forces must be balanced. The only two forces we have have got to be balanced. We're going to say QE, the electric force, equals mg, the gravitational force. And then we're going to turn around and solve for Q. Okay, if it's suspended, that's what we're going to do. Now, if it's accelerating, this is what we're going to do. F net is equal to the sum of the forces, Fe plus Fg. And then we're going to replace F net with M times A, Fe with Qe, and force of gravity with M times G. Then we're going to turn around and solve for charge, although you're probably going to rearrange it after you've plugged your numbers into this one. Get charge. Hey, get the charge. Whichever way we do it, whether we're dealing with suspended or constant velocity or whether we're dealing with accelerating charges, that charge that you find should either be about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 or a whole number multiple of that. It could be 2 times that. It could be 27 times that. But it's not going to be 43.8 times that. Okay, it might be 43 times that value or 44 times that value. It should be a whole number multiple of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Now, having said that, with experimental data, it doesn't always work out the way we expect, right? The way it should. When they give us a question, it could be cooked up experimental data, which means that you may get an answer that's not a whole number multiple of 1.6. But if you do get an answer that's not a whole number multiple of that, even though it is possible to be correct in that question, it's worth checking. It's worth double checking. Okay, because it likely still will be a whole number multiple or really, really close to that. All right. All right. One more thing uh, before we take a look at a problem here, or a couple problems here. Um, remember what I always said when you're doing these problems every single time, besides the analysis that you see up on the board there in red or purple, what should you do? Every single time. Three words. Draw a picture, okay? Draw which way the electric field is. Okay, they'll usually tell us the electric field is upwards or the electric field is downwards or whatever the case may be. Draw the particle. Draw which way the forces are. If this is suspended, okay, then we know the gravitational force has to act downwards and the electric force must act upwards if it's suspended. And if the electric force is up and the field is up, that's going to be a positive particle, right? Now, on the other hand, if the electric field was downwards, and it's suspended, then we know that it must be a negative particle because the force must be opposite to the field, and that only happens when you have a negatively charged particle. So do the analysis in red or purple, but also draw your picture because the picture is going to be what leads you to the correct type of charge or it's going to uh, lead you to the, the number of electrons gained or lost. Remember, by the way, to find number of electrons. It's just the total charge divided by the charge of one of uh, one electron. We did one of these the other day, right? But is it electrons gained or lost? Is it positive or negative charge? Uh, draw your picture and figure it out. All right, two questions I want you to work on on that one right away. And those are questions number two and three on the booklet. All right, here we go. In a Millikan-like uh, oil drop experiment, a charged oil drop is suspended between two plates this far apart. I'm going to circle this. I don't think I'm going to end up using that number in this question, but uh, just in case, I'm going to draw attention to the fact that it's centimeters. Because listen, um, you get 50 questions on this exam, and you make a mistake with unit conversions three times, well, then the best you can do is 94. And don't get me wrong, if you get 94 on this exam, I'll be extremely happy. That's a great mark on this exam, but you don't want to be starting at 94. You don't want to be, you don't, you don't want 94 to be the highest mark you can get before you start making other mistakes, okay? Don't mess up, don't mess up on little things like unit conversions like that. Here's the electric field between the, uh, um, between the plates, and the electric field is directed toward the top plate. The mass of the oil drop is its value. We want to find the magnitude and the type of charge present. Let's draw our picture here. We know the electric field is upwards. If it's suspended, if it's suspended and it tells us that it is, then we know the gravitational force must be down and the electric force must be up. Otherwise, it wouldn't be suspended. Now, it could be traveling at a constant speed. Um, we do exactly the same thing. 
FE equals FG, or QE equals M times G. Rearrange this to solve for Q, and we get MG over E. When you do the math on that, it works out to be uh, 4.8 times 10 to the minus 19. But this doesn't tell us anything about whether it's a positive or a negative charge. We know that it must be a positive charge because the electric force is in the same direction as the electric field. Okay, you don't get that part of the question correct if you don't draw your diagram. Make sure you do that, please. Question number three. This time, we're, we're changing the charge on the droplet. It becomes 8E, 8 times the elementary charge, and it accelerates upwards. We know the electric field is still upwards. We know that it's a positive charge for sure, because they tell us, right, 8E. If it was negative, it would say negative 8E. It accelerates upwards, so we know the electric force is bigger than the gravity force. We're going to say F net is equal to the sum of the forces. That's Fe plus Fg. Ma is equal to Qe plus mg. Uh, what do we got here? The mass of this oil droplet was uh, 8.61 times 10 to the minus 16. We're going to solve for A. Uh, charge is, I think it was 9.6, wasn't it? 8 times 1.6, is that 9.6? I'm going to say it is until somebody tells me different. Yeah. 12.8. All right. There you go. That's what I was asking you. Times 10 to the minus 19 or 1.28 times 10 to the minus 18. Times the electric field uh, was 1.76 times 10 to the 4. plus the mass times uh, gravity, 9.81. This force is negative because it's acting downwards. We have it drawn downwards. Label it downwards. Okay, solve for A here. And I think it worked out to be B. Is that what it was? 16.4? As it turned out, I could have gotten away without the diagram in this one, right? I didn't need to use a diagram for anything, but it's a good habit to be in, even if you don't need the answer there. All right, so Millikan found the charge of the, of, the, uh, of the electron. That's great. But combined with Thompson's analysis, remember Thompson found this. Millikan found this. The two of them combined could find this. Right? If you plug this charge into Thompson's results, then you can find the mass, and it works out to be 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So Thompson charge the mass ratio, Millikan charge, Millikan and Thompson would have been the mass. Well, then we shift gears a little bit and start talking about not these electrons, but rather the nucleus itself and how the nucleus can change. Unlike in chemistry, when carbon remains carbon and sodium remains sodium, in physics, if we're looking at the nucleus, we know that the nucleus can actually change into something else or transmutate into something else. Isotope rotation. Okay, just remember that in isotope rotation, we got two numbers. An atomic number and a mass number. The bottom number is a smaller one. It's the atomic number, and it represents the number of protons. And the top number, that's the mass number. It's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if you want to find the number of protons, just look at the bottom number. If you want to find the number of neutrons, take the top number and minus the bottom number. Know where to find this on your periodic table, right? Know where to find the symbols for the elements, but know what number you're looking for on the periodic table as well. It's always this number. The bigger number on the periodic table, which on your periodic table would be a decimal number, don't look at that number. The only reason you're ever going to pay any attention to that whatsoever in physics is to kind of find roughly where something is, okay? I get a, 
a nucleus, an isotope carbon-14. I don't know where to find that on the uh, periodic table because it doesn't tell me what the atomic number is. Look for those big numbers, those atomic masses on your periodic table that are somewhere around 12, 13, 14. Okay? And when you look there, you'll find that the atomic number of carbon is 6. Again, it's the atomic number that you really want, though. All right. You talked about... I'm going to create a new page here for this one. You talked about three types of radioactivity, um, and then one of the types got broken down into two subcategories. We had alpha decay, we had beta decay, which was consisted of beta minus and beta plus, and we had gamma decay. An alpha particle was exactly the same thing as a as a helium nucleus. Sometimes you see a ribbon like this. Sometimes you see a ribbon like this. This is exactly the same thing as an electron. This is exactly the same thing as a not a proton but a positron, the antiparticle of an electron. And this is a gamma ray. We don't have another symbol for that one. You'll remember, maybe, that alpha particles or alpha decay occurs when you have a big nucleus. Now, not always, not every big nucleus, but a lot of big nuclei are unstable because you have too many protons. Now, remember what the deal was of this? There's two forces right now that we care about in the nucleus. There's the attractive force. Okay, that's going to be what we call the strong nuclear force. There's a repulsive force. That's the electrostatic force. The strong nuclear force acts between proton and proton and proton and neutron and neutron and neutron. Everything that's in the nucleus, the strong nuclear force pulls it together. Now, the repulsive force acts between protons and protons, and it wants to push the nucleus apart or break the nucleus apart. If the attractive strong nuclear force is bigger, if it wins, then the nucleus is stable. If the repulsive electrostatic force is bigger, then it's not stable. The nucleus will break apart and give off a helium nucleus or an alpha particle, and then be slightly smaller as a result of that. So its stability comes from the ratio of protons to neutrons. If the ratio isn't right, then the forces aren't right. And if the forces aren't right, then it's going to break apart. Beta negative decay occurs when you have too many neutrons. But for a completely different reason. This is a force thing. Right? This is a force thing up here. It's a force problem. This is an energy problem. You have too many neutrons, but it doesn't have anything to do with the forces. It has everything to do with the energy. When you have too many neutrons, it's energetically unstable, not force unstable, energetically unstable. So what happens? You take a neutron and you change it into a proton and an electron. Why do we have to have an electron produced there as well? If we didn't, it would violate which law? Yep, conservation of charge. Neutral would become positive. It can't happen. So we have to have something negative produced there as well. This electron, by the way, that's the beta particle that leaves the atom, leaves the nucleus, I should say. And then the proton stays behind. Started off with carbon-14, now we end up with nitrogen-14 because we have an extra proton. Beta plus occurs, again, because of an energy problem, but this time the energy problem results from having, once again, too many protons. But it has a completely different result because of a different, fundamentally different cause, right? It's the same different or too many protons but it's not too many protons giving us a, a force problem it's too many protons giving us an energy problem so what do we do we take a proton and we change it into a neutron and a positron again I have to have that positron to not violate the law of conservation of charge and then this positron ends up leaving that's the beta plus particle in the beta plus emission and then finally, the gamma ray is produced as a byproduct.
of something that's already happened. Beta decay has occurred, alpha decay has occurred. The nucleus is left in an excited state, but it doesn't want to be there. So it goes back down to its normal state. And as it does that, it gives off a photon, a gamma ray photon. Remember we said uh, yesterday, was it yesterday? No, two days ago when we reviewed EMR, gamma rays were produced by nuclear decay. This is the kind of nuclear decay we're talking about. You got alpha decay, you got beta decay. Okay? Then gamma rays are given off as a byproduct of that alpha or beta decay. Now, we call all four of these types of radiation ionizing radiation. What does that, what does that mean, ionizing radiation? X-rays are ionizing radiation as well, but they're just not produced in the same way, not radioactive decay. Ionizing radiation is radiation like alpha, beta, gamma, X-rays, whatever, that has the ability to ionize atoms, to turn atoms that are neutral into ions that are charged. And that's a bad thing. Oftentimes it's a bad thing. Not always, but oftentimes it's a bad thing because when we're exposed to that ionizing radiation, it can turn atoms in us into ions that aren't supposed to be there. And when we have ions that aren't supposed to be there, we get chemical reactions taking place that aren't supposed to take place. And that can lead to all kinds of things from uh, radiation burns to um, cataracts in your eyes to sickness to uh, more serious things like cancers to acute radiation poisoning to almost instant death. All right, let's take a look at a couple properties of each of these types of ionizing radiation. First of all, the penetrating power, and second of all, the ionizing potential. They all have the ability to ionize matter, but alpha particles have the strongest ability, the highest ability to ionize matter. Gamma rays have the weakest ability to ionize matter. It's not to suggest that they're not dangerous. They are very dangerous. But they have less ability to ionize matter than alpha particles, or beta particles for that matter. They're the fence sitters. They're in the middle. Although they have the lowest ionizing potential, they have the highest penetrating power. Gamma rays are going to be able to penetrate several centimeters of lead or concrete, easily go right through your body. Whereas alpha particles, you get two or three sheets of paper, two or three sheets of paper will stop alpha particles. They have a pretty low penetrating power. Now, that's not to say that they can't do anything to you. They, can, they could burn your skin. Okay? But in the end, they're not going to get inside your body because they don't have the penetrating ability to get inside your body. The danger from there really comes from, really comes from um, if, you're, if, you're, if you've consumed something that produces alpha particle and it decays when it's inside your body as opposed to being exposed to the alpha particles themselves. Beta decay, once again, those are the fence sitters, beta plus and beta minus. They're somewhere in the middle. They can penetrate a, a few centimeters of human flesh, but they wouldn't be stopped by your skin like alpha particles are. All right? I got a couple questions I want you to work on here, questions four and five please, in your book. All right, let's do number four. Which of the following types of radiation will have its path deflected by a perpendicular electric field? How many people said A? B? C? D? Most people said A. How come the answer is A? It is, by the way. But how come the answer is A? Yeah, you got them? Good. Electric fields deflect things with charge. They affect things with charge. And alpha particles and beta particles are the only ones that have charge. So, again, know why you're answering something, right? If you pick D, all right. If you pick D, fair enough. But know why you're picking D. Okay, in the end, um, it's pretty hard to justify that one because gamma rays don't have any charge. They're not going to be deflected. Number five, the product of radioactive decay that penetrates matter the least is blank because of its relatively blank mass and charge. Well, we know the least is alpha particles, right? Because of its relatively, ooh, I, ne I never answered this in that table that I just gave you, right? It's relatively blank mass and charge. All right, what are we comparing it to? 
when, it, when we say relative, then we're comparing it to something, right? What are we comparing it to? To the other thing here, the beta particle. Does it have a bigger mass and charge than a beta particle or a smaller mass and charge than a beta particle? Well, it has twice the charge, and it has a few thousand times the mass. It's a bigger mass and charge. It's still pretty light in the grand scheme of things, but compared to an electron or a beta particle, it's a pretty big mass and charge. So it has a, it penetrates matter the least because of its relatively large mass and charge. All right, let's finish up this a little bit on radioactivity here. And talk for a second about transmutation equations in this neutrino, antineutrino thing. Transmutation is just the conversion of one element to another, right? So we've got something like uranium-235. And you're told that it undergoes alpha decay. What else is it going to produce? Well, we know that 2 plus 90 gives me 92. 4 plus 231 gives me 235. That ends up being thorium. If you don't remember that, that's OK. Just go to your, to your periodic table and your data booklet, and it'll tell you that it's, that it's thorium. So we had uh, carbon-14 undergoing beta-negative decay. What do we got? Minus 1 plus. Remember I told you when we did this the first time that this is one of the most common mistakes that are made in all of this unit? And then something like 30% of you made that mistake on your unit test? Minus 1 plus what equals 6? Jordan? 7. Good. 0 plus 14 equals 14. That's a nitrogen Nucleus, by the way. Plus what else? Nitrogen 7 and an antineutrino. If we happen to have beta plus decay, hey, I'm going to make up a reaction here because I never remember an example of beta plus. Let's pretend for a second that carbon-14 would undergo beta plus. Just pretend for a second. If it did, we'd end up with 14 and 5. 14.5, is that boron? Plus a neutrino. 1 plus 5 is 6, minus 1 plus 7 is equal to 6. Hey, by the way, what physics principle do we use right here? Balancing the atomic number. What physics principle is that? Conservation of charge. And what physics principle do we use up here when we're balancing the number of protons and neutrons combined, the mass number? Conservation of no nucleons. Conservation of nucleons. Good. All right, let's do one more. Question number seven, please. Ready to take a look at this one now? Um, look, we got a bunch of different decays that are taking place here. Five, five different decays to get us from lead to 12 to whatever we end up with over here. And there's a couple different paths that it can go through to get to this final product, product number four over here. And we want to figure out um, what each of these things are along the way, what each, what each daughter nucleus is along at each step along the way. So we have lead uh, 212 undergoing beta negative decay. Let's write this one out here. Uh, lead 212 undergoing beta decay produces a beta particle plus what else? 0 plus 212 gives me 212. Eight, uh, sorry, minus 1 plus 83 gives me 82. So this one's going to be, number 1 is going to be bismuth. Bismuth 212. So we're going to say bismuth 212 occurs at position 1. Now what do we got? Bismuth-212 is going to decay by alpha decay up here. So we're going to say 212-83 goes to an alpha particle plus what else? Uh, 4 plus 208. 2 plus 81 gives me, uh, what's 81? Uh, number 81 is... What is 81? Uh, is it TL? Is it TL or TI? TL? So we're going to say number 2 is going to be this one. 
Let's down, look down here at the beta negative decay. We're saying, uh, once again, we got bismuth 212 undergoes beta negative decay plus 0 plus 212 minus 1 plus 84. So minus 1 plus 84 is going to give me polonium 212. So number 3 is going to be polonium 212. Now they both lead us to the same product in number four here. We can go one way or we can look at both ways as a little check here. We've got TL208, beta decay, 208 and 82, or we can look at it using this one, 212 and 84 undergoes alpha decay, which gives me 208 and 82. Any way you look at it, that's going to be lead. Lead 208. So that one's going to be a four. How many people got that one? Good. Good. Uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a tricky question because it forces us to kind of not just write a single transmutation equation, but to kind of interpret what they mean by this bigger context of the question here. Remember that technically we'd also have an antineutrino produced in a few places here. All right. Uh, I got one more. I don't really want to do this because of time, but I do want to do it because it's a great question. The one that I want you to look at right now is going to be question number 11. Goes with some information, by the way. Goes with some information down here. So we're going to skip a couple of questions that go with this. Skip one question, I guess, and go straight to question number 11. Our first clue as to what to do on this question is this word down here that says it's an isolated system. When we have an isolated system, they're telling us that we don't have any external forces. Momentum is conserved. The initial momentum equals the final momentum. That's exactly what we're going to do with this. PI equals PF. It's an explosion, right? It doesn't matter if it's a gun being fired or a nucleus splitting apart. It's an explosion. The initial momentum is zero. The final momentum is M1V1F plus M2V2F. Now, we've got everything we need here. Okay? We've got the mass of the nucleus. We've got the mass of the neutron that goes the other way. Nucleus goes one way, neutron goes the other way, right? We've got both of those masses. We've got the, the speed or the velocity of the nucleus, um, sorry, of the neutron, I should say, and we're solving for the one final velocity. That's of the, of the nucleus. And when we do that, it ends up being 1.36 times 10 to the 6. Work through that. Okay, if you didn't get the answer to this, then work through it to make sure that you can get the answer to that. Uh, but you know now at least you're going to use conservation momentum. I mean, 1.83. 1.83 times 10 to the 6. Yeah, let's try that one. That's close. No, that's the right answer. 1.83 times 10 to the 6. And, of course, it's the law of conservation momentum that we used, D. All right? You know, listen, half-life, uh, I got an example here that pretty much covers everything over here except the half-life graph. So for the most part, that's what we'll do. Basically, just remember um, a couple of equations that we're allowed to use here. One that doesn't appear on our data sheet and one that does appear on our data sheet. And remember that we're allowed to use, we're allowed to use whatever units we want as long as we're consistent. All right? No, no real tricks here. Okay, no real tricks with this. Let's just go straight to an example on this um, for both the equation and for the graph. Okay, equation first. For that one, I'd like you to try question number 12. Now let's have a look. A forensic investigator was asked to analyze a human skeleton to determine when it was living. The investigator estimated the ratio of calcium-45 to stable calcium-40. So calcium-45, which is radioactive, calcium-40, which is not radioactive, it's stable. And the remains to be 130 second, 132 of the uh, ratio in living bone tissue. So here's the deal. In a living bone tissue, you have a certain ratio of radioactive calcium to, um, to uh, stable calcium. But 
and that remains a relatively constant value, a relatively constant ratio throughout life. But when we die, that ratio changes because when we when the radioactive uh, calcium decays, then the ratio of radioactive to regular calcium decreases. So we can look at the ratio and then estimate how long it was since the ratio was what it should have been when it was living based on the half-life of this calcium-45. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, um, we want to find how long ago the person died. We're going to say n is equal to t over t one-half. Rearrange that to solve for t, the time, which is n times t one-half. But we don't know what n is, so we've got a couple of options here. We can use the equation n is equal to n sub zero one-half to the little n and solve for a little n using logarithms. Some of you like to use logarithms, some of you don't. Or you can use that divide by two method. Since I usually show you logarithms, I'm going to show you the divide by two method this time. Zero half-lives, we've got, well, we start off with one, right? Because we end up with one thirty-second. After one half-life, that's going to be, uh, I'm going to go with fractions here, one half only because they go with fractions. Two half-lives, it's one quarter. Three half-lives, it's one eighth. Four half-lives, it's one sixteenth of the original value. Five half-lives, keep dividing by two, it's one thirty-second. So there's my, there's my number of half-lives, five. It's five times T one-half, 164 days. It ends up giving me an answer of 8.20 times 10 to the two. So we'd express that as 8202. How many people got it? One more question on this stuff now. I'd like you to take a look at question number six. This is relating to a half-life graph. All right. In these uh, questions, we said basically you got to be able to go up and over or over and down. Okay, we're looking for an amount after three half-lives. Well, first of all, we need to know what a half-life is, right? The time for half of it to decay. We start off with 4,200. That's my original amount. After one half-life, I'm going to end up with 2,100. So I want to go over from 2,100 and down. Looks like the half-life is, this is kind of odd on the bottom, the way they have these, these lines drawn. That's actually 2.4. 2.4, 2.8, 3.2, 3.6, and 4. So the half-life is 2.4. Be careful you don't make that like a 2.1 or a 2.2. Okay, make sure you know what, what the interval is there. 2.4 is our half-life. Now, after three half-lives, that would be what? 7.2 days? So let's go over here to 7.2 days. This is 6.4, 6.8, uh, 7.2 days. Let's go up and over. And after 7.2 days, we're going to end up with, looks like somewhere around 500, 520. How many people got that one? Good. So we need the half-life, and then from the half-life, okay, um, we're going to figure out how much we have left after three of them. The half-life is, is uh, 2.4 minutes. So how much do we got left after 7.2 minutes? Carry question? How's it Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. That'll that'll work. Be careful with that, though. Okay. Um, Carrie said, I don't know if anybody else did it this way. Carrie said she started off with 4,200 divided by two, divided by two, divided by two, right, three times, and she got 525. I'm careful that. What we do there when we're using a divide by two method or using one of the equations is a statistical analysis of what happens, right? This is actual data. So if you have a big enough sample size, the statistical analysis is going to match up with the data, right? But it's not 100%. Make sense? Those equations are predictions. This is what's already happened, Carrie. Does that make sense? So odds are it's going to work out pretty close to the same thing, and you're going to get away with that. But I would prefer you, if you have a graph, to use the graph as opposed to just taking an initial amount and using the divide by two method. Okay? But probably nine times out of ten, that's going to work out for you. Okay, let's move forward and talk a little bit about fission and fusion here.
conservation of of charge, conservation of nucleons, right, when we balance equations, and then conservation of mass energy when we use E is equal to mc squared, because we know we got to use that here. Look, fission is when two lighter, sorry, when one heavy nucleus splits up, often the one we see here is uranium-235. A neutron gets fired at it, gets absorbed by it for a brief moment in time, splits up into krypton and barium and some neutrons plus some energy. Okay, that's a fission reaction. A fusion reaction is maybe when we have H2 plus H2 forming something heavier. And plus a neutron plus some energy. What do we know about the energy of this reaction versus the energy of this reaction? What do we know about the energy of fission compared to fusion? Per unit mass or per kilogram of fuel, which one's going to generate more energy? Fission, fusion. Always going to be fusion, right? Per kilogram of fuel, fusion will generate more energy. What do we know about the relative safety of these things in terms of their products? Helium-3 compared to krypton and barium. These are radioactive. This is not radioactive. This is pretty harmless. This, these are radioactive. So we know that fusion produces more energy per kilogram, but the products are much safer than the products of nuclear fission. More energy, but safer products, not radioactive products. How do we get these things going? Well, um, one reaction isn't enough to really do anything. So what we have to get is what we call a chain reaction. We kickstart the first reaction by firing a neutron, making it unstable, and then we get a bunch of neutrons coming out of it that kind of continue the reaction. These neutrons uh, fuse, or I don't, I don't want to say that word fuse, I shouldn't say that, um, join with uranium-235 to split it up even more, and so on and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a chain reaction caused by these neutrons, the products of that reaction. This one has a chain reaction as well. There's energy produced here. It's the energy that causes the chain reaction this time. Remember, we need energy to make the, the nuclear fusion reaction go, right? It needs energy to kickstart it into, into action here. And the reason is because these nuclei are both positively charged and they repel each other. So we need a lot of energy pumped into it to overcome that force of repulsion. And when we get a bunch of energy out of it, some of that energy that comes out of it can go into fusing more hydrogen together and keeping this thing going, keeping a chain reaction going here. All right, a couple of terms here. We talked about mass defect and binding energy. Mass defect, find it in two ways. There was the nucleus. When we have a single nucleus, there's a mass defect. The mass of the nucleus is less than the mass of the nucleons. So in other words, if you've got carbon-14, You have six protons and eight neutrons. The mass of six protons and eight neutrons is more than the mass of carbon-14. The mass of the nucleus is less than the mass of the nucleons. If we're looking at a reaction here, then the mass of the products, or we'll say the mass of the daughter, is less than the mass of the parent. So if you have a fusion reaction, then these hydrogen are going to weigh more than this helium and the neutron. Sometimes what we got to do is find the energy that's equivalent to that mass defect, the energy that's released in a reaction. And we're going to find energy by calculating the mass defect 
and then multiplying it by c squared. Now, how do we get the mass defect? Well, the mass defect over here would be found by taking six protons plus eight neutrons, getting a certain mass, and then comparing it to the mass of carbon-14. So get the mass of all your protons, get the mass of all your neutrons. It's going to be a certain number. Compare it to the mass of carbon-14, subtract the two. Okay, that's your mass defect. You want to find the equivalent energy, the binding energy, multiply by C squared. Over here, we're going to say get the mass of the products or the mass of the daughter nuclei. Get the mass of the parent nuclei. Subtract the two. That's going to give you the mass defect. And then we're going to multiply it by C squared to get the energy released. Right? Question, guys? Girls? We good? So remember, there's, there's two ways we define mass defects, right? The nucleus and the reaction. The difference in mass between what makes up the nucleus and the nucleus itself. The difference in mass between what we start with, products, or sorry, uh, reactants, and what we finish with, the products, or daughter and, and parent nuclei. What units are we going to deal with here? Um, Usually kilograms. Usually it's going to be kilograms, but we said that you can also expect to see possibly atomic mass units. And on our data sheet, it tells us that one atomic mass unit is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So if you do happen to see atomic mass units, you do a conversion. One atomic mass unit, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. 3.4 atomic mass units or whatever, divided by x kilograms, solve for kilograms. You do calculations, you always want to be in kilograms, right? All right. Listen, you got to be able to balance equations and so on, but if you can balance, if you can balance the transmutations equations in, in radioactivity, you can do it in fission fusion as well. It's the same thing. Right? Just make sure the mass number and the atomic number works out. Okay, we're getting there. The gold foil, sometimes you see this called the alpha scattering experiment. Maybe they do this. I've always heard it called the gold foil experiment, but on your diploma exam, sometimes they call it the alpha scattering experiment. Um, maybe they do that to remind you, because I remember giving you a question on a test. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but some of you got mixed up as to what Rutherford was even using. I think some of you said it was gamma rays or something like that. He's firing alpha particles at this gold foil, and he wants to see what's inside this gold foil. Fires alpha particles at it and see what happens to it. Notice just three things happen. Most of the alpha particles go straight through. Some of the alpha particles are deflected. They go through, but they're deflected. A few of the alpha particles bounce back. And of course, the first one tells us that most of the nucleus, most of the atom, I should say, is empty space. Otherwise, it wouldn't go straight through. Some of the alpha particles are deflected. It tells us that, well, it's not all empty space. There's something in the middle there. It's got to be small, because most of it's empty space. The thing that's in the middle has got to be small and positively charged in order to repel the positively charged alpha particles. And finally, a few of them bounce back. It tells us that that small positive thing that we call the nucleus, it's also got to be dense. It's also got to be heavy, right? Because otherwise, the alpha particles aren't going to bounce off it and bounce back. They're going to just knock the nucleus out of the way. So small, dense, positively charged nucleus surrounded by mostly empty space. Where are the electrons? Well, they're orbiting around. Called the planetary model of the atom because it's kind of like the planets orbiting around the, uh, the uh, sun. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was a Rutherford gold foil, or sometimes you see it called the Rutherford alpha scattering experiment. All right, I'd like you to have a look at uh, question number question number 18 now, please.
Real similar, by the way, to question number 17. Try number 18 right now and then go back later on and see if you can get number 17. What's the answer to question number 18? The nuclear atom. The nuclear atom. Well, when you read that, think, okay, wh what do we mean by the nuclear atom? Who was the first guy to say we have a nucleus? It was Rutherford, right? Planetary model of the atom. Consequence of experiment using alpha particle scattering. Question 17, we could have done just as, just as easily. Rutherford's model of the atom was developed from observations of the scattering of alpha particles. We've seen the question as simple as this a few times on diploma exams. Hey, that's a that's a that's that's supposed to be a gimme question. Get your take your two percent and move on to the next question there. Okay. Yep. Yeah, they're all not just diploma style questions. They're all. Yeah, you know what? I say that uh, they may not all be diploma questions, but the vast majority are. They're, they're all from Quest A Plus, which I told you guys here a couple weeks ago. Go do Quest A Plus questions. The vast majority of those questions are diploma questions. There are a few of them that are field tested questions, which, but they're all like that. Yeah, they're all either diploma or really, really close to making a diploma exam. Next, we've got the Bohr model. The Bohr model, the atom, the Rutherford model, the atom, the planetary model versus the Bohr model. We could call the Rutherford model, the atom, the planetary model. We don't really have a name for the Bohr model other than the Bohr model, but if we did, what word should we use to describe it? There's the solid sphere model. There's the plum pudding model. There's the planetary model. I mean, we don't have a name like that for the Bohr model, but what would a good name like that be if we did? I'm thinking of one word right now. The level. The level model of the atom. Because that's what distinguishes it right from the planetary model of the atom is electron levels. The first aspect of it said that we do have these levels, and each level is characterized by a specific energy. The second aspect, let's actually go back to the second aspect in a second here. The third aspect of it talked about transitions. Electrons can absorb energy and go to a higher level, or they can give off energy and go to a lower level. Usually that energy is in the form of EMR, photons, that are either absorbed or given off. That second one, that second aspect, it's this idea of stationary states. Maxwell said that electrons, as they accelerate, should emit EMR. And look, these electrons, as they orbit around the nucleus, they accelerate. This is centripetal acceleration toward the center of the circle. But they don't give off EMR. They should, but they don't. Maxwell's theory contradicts this whole Bohr model of the atom. So we're saying that it's like these these electrons as they orbit around the nucleus, it's as if they're not accelerating. They are, but it's as if they're not accelerating because they're not emitting EMR. It's as if they're not even moving. It's as if they're stationary. They're in a stationary state. Remember we did, um, we talked about um, uh, atomic spectra. There was three kinds of spectra. There was the continuous spectrum, and that wasn't produced by transitions that was just produced by a hot solid or it could be a liquid or it could be a high pressure gas and it produced all the colors of the rainbow we also had a, a line emission spectrum that was produced by a low pressure gas and that was the one where we got these, these photons that were produced, these lines that were a result of individual photons versus this continuous rainbow that we had in the first one. And the third one, of course, was this absorption spectrum, which is almost like the continuous spectrum. It's the same as the continuous spectrum, except it's passed through a cold gas, a cool gas.
And when it's passed through a cool gas, you no longer have a continuous spectrum. What you have is a continuous spectrum minus a few photons that were taken away by the cool gas, causing the electrons to jump to higher levels. We also had electron level diagrams. They always looked like this, right? Spacing got further and further as you get closer to the nucleus down here. The ground state, or level one, two, three, four, and so on. What did I tell you about the energy levels here? Here's a level, here's a level, here's a level. Never use the energy of one level, ever. Use the energy difference. Use the difference between level two and level one, the difference between level four and level one, the difference between level three and, and level two. It's the energy difference that's important. Sometimes you're given the energy difference. Sometimes you're given the energy of each level. You're given the difference already? Great, use it. If you're not, then find it by subtracting and then use that difference. And that energy difference between the levels is equal to HF, but it's also equal to HC over lambda. So if you find that energy difference, or you already have it, you can set that equal to HF or HC over lambda to find the frequency of the photon that was absorbed or emitted or the wavelength of the photon that was absorbed or emitted. And finally, we talk about ionization energy. That just means that the energy that's required to go from level one to the infinite level, when it's actually left the atom. So all you do there is subtract them again. The ionization energy would be the final energy minus the initial energy. What's the frequency required to ionize it? Find the difference in energy, set it equal to H times F. Joules, electron volts, whatever. Just use the right Planck's constant to go along with it. I got three questions that I want you to work on with the Bohr model of the atom. We're going to start off with question 15, multiple choice number 15. There it is. What's the answer here? As EMR escapes the super hot core of the sun, it passes through cool gas from the sun's atmosphere. The result this results in the production of, what's the answer? How many people said A? B, C, D, cool gas. As soon as you see those words cool gas, it's an absorption spectrum, right? We've got a continuous spectrum, but yet we have a few photons missing from that continuous spectrum because of this cool gas. The next one that I want you to take a look at here is question number 19, please. Let's see the answer to this one. Each element of the periodic table produces a unique emission spectrum when excited because each element has a unique what? How many people said A? B? How many people said A? A, B, C, D? The answer is D. It's electron, or sorry, energy level configuration. Okay. Now, it's the energy level configuration because the, the emission of EMR is related not to where an electron is, but to the energy level configuration, the difference in energy levels, right? So we go from one level to another level. Okay. If that's a different configuration than in a different atom, then we're going to get a different uh, emission spectrum that's produced there. So the answer would be D. Uh, one more question that I want you to do here before we move on to the next topic, number 21, please. All right, the question says, in, an S in the SEM, this is what we call a scanning electron microscope. There was actually information that went along with this before this uh, and where it appeared on the actual exam. I just deleted it because we didn't need it for this for this question. But anyway, it says, some of the electrons in the original beam knock electrons loose from lower levels. 
of the atom in the specimen and the electron in a higher level of these atoms then makes a transition to fill the vacated lower energy level. We kind of talked about this a little bit, not in the context of the scanning electron microscope, but when we first introduced this topic of electron transitions, right? Electrons want to fill the lower levels first. If there's a vacancy, one rushes in to take its place. Um, I gave you the analogy of the saddle dome, right? You got, I don't know, let's say 10,000 people in the first level of the saddle dome. Okay, I'm sitting up in the third deck and I'm looking down at the hockey game and I see three seats down in the first row okay, for the entire first period. What do I do? I go, I run down there during the first intermission and I fill in those vacancies. I want to fill in the lower levels first and that's what electrons do as well. If there's a vacancy, then somebody's going to rush down and take that seat. The following energy level diagram shows two possible electron transitions in lead. So here's we've got uh, a transition K alpha from L to K, and then we've got uh, K uh, beta from uh, M to K. And clearly this is a bigger transition, so the energy involved here would be bigger than the energy involved here. Even if we didn't have numbers, we could still determine that, that this is a bigger transition, therefore bigger energy, therefore higher frequency of photon that would be released, therefore lower wavelength a photon that would be released. We want to find the energy of the photons in this one. So the frequency of the photons. So let's get the energy of the photons first. The energy is not going to be 22 or 89. Rather, the energy of the photons is going to be negative 89.2 minus minus 22. That gives me an energy of the transition, I think, of 87.2. It's actually negative, but we always drop the sign when we're doing a calculation with it. Sorry, not 87, but 67. Does that make more sense? Just a little test. See if you're paying attention. After two hours, are we still getting that? It's good. Think of this as the diploma exam. You've got another hour to have to be able to think for right now, right? Think your mind is mush right now? Wait till three hours of the diploma exam when you're doing all the stuff yourself. 67.2 electron volts, or negative, but we'll make it positive. We want to find the frequency here. Let's set that equal to HF. F is equal to E over H. Make sure you use the 4.14 value of Planck's constant because we're using electron volts here. Now, you could convert this to joules. That would be fine, but it's not necessary to do that, I don't think. Recognize that you're using electron volts here. We get an answer of 1.62 times 10 to the 16. How many people got that? We'd express that as simply 1.62 on this one, or 1.62 in our boxes right there. Now, the reason I picked this question to give you on this, on this little uh, practice thing here, as opposed to some other question that was much like this, is because of the follow-up question. I don't really like this, actually, but I picked it because I don't like it. If you want to find the region of the EM spectrum in which photons corresponding to the K alpha and K beta lines for lead are classified, it's most likely what? Most likely what? Well, I'm looking at this, and right away I'm thinking ultraviolet, UV. Right, 10 to the 14 is visible light. 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 20 is x-rays. Something, and it's going to be UV, right? I got 10 to the 16. 10 to the 16 UV, but UV is not even an option. So what am I going to go with? It's closer to 10 to the 17 than it is 10 to the 14, right? So I'm going to go with x-rays. Now, the other way, I don't like that because it doesn't fit in that, uh, in that categorization. But the other thing you can do besides looking at, oh, it's closer to x-rays, is this. That's the frequency of the smallest transition. The bigger transition is going to be a higher energy, right? I don't know what that energy is, but it's not less energy. It's not closer to visible light. It's even closer to x-rays. So we've got something that's closer to x-rays and then so, than it is UV, uh, sorry, than it is visible light, and something that's even closer to x-rays than it is visible light. So I'm going to go with x-rays there. The answer is x-rays. I just wish that uh, it fit nicely into one of the categories. Sometimes it's a little gray. What they wouldn't do is put UV as an option and expect you to pick x-rays. They wouldn't do that to you. It's going to mean to do this to you, but they wouldn't put UV and then expect you to just know that it was x-rays. Yep. Yeah. Of the transition, yeah. 
No, you don't. No. If you did, then all that's going to happen is you're going to get a negative frequency, which can't really happen, right? So just drop the negative somewhere, whether it's with the energy or with, this, with the frequency. Okay, boy, we're almost done. We might actually be finished before two and a half hours today. I think we will. Topic 53 and 54, we'll kind of do together here. These will go pretty quickly. Basically, guys, we're talking about particle accelerators. We got to remember that they're high energy collisions because we want to break these particles apart, right? We want to find out what's inside, break them apart. How do we break them apart? Get them going, get them moving at incredibly high speeds, incredibly high energies. That's going to overcome the nuclear forces and cause them to break apart. It's like those two cars colliding. The bolts break, the welds break, the plastic breaks. Everything breaks and everything goes flying out. We see what's inside because we had high enough energy to overcome all of those attractive forces. We won't go through the details of the cloud chamber and the bubble chamber other than they both leave trails. And we follow those trails. We try to... We try to deduce things from the trails, the bubble trail or the condensation trail. Just like we deduce things about the condensation trail following the airplane. I was watching last night, I don't know why I was watching this, but on YouTube, came up as a suggested video when I was uploading some stuff on the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster in 1986. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, that video or not of the Challenger exploding on live TV, but it's going up for a minute or so, and then it literally explodes, and there's, there's, there's condensation trails going everywhere, everywhere. Okay? So they deduced all kinds of things, all kinds of things about the explosion without actually seeing the explosion because it was surrounded. Nobody actually ever saw the cabin or the explosion or whatever. They just deduced all kinds of things because of the, tr the condensation trail that followed all of these pieces of it. That's what we do. We follow the trails. Okay, we reduce, deduce properties. Maybe we introduce a magnetic field, an electric field, and see how that affects it, maybe. Okay, so what do we end up, what do we end up getting out of this whole deal, guys? This, this whole cloud chamber, bubble chamber, so on. Particle accelerator, these leptons, these are the things like electrons and neutrinos. We talked about a whole bunch of other types of particles, right? But I said that we're not, there's a lot of that stuff that we mentioned in class the one day that we don't really have to know. I'm not going to go through all that today. Okay, that was for perspective. Today, here's what you got to remember. Electrons and neutrinos are examples of leptons plus the antiparticles, they're fundamental particles. Then there's the hadrons, which are protons and neutrons. And they're made up of quarks. And there's six types of quarks. And we got to know about two of them. We have to know about the, the up quark and the down quark. The up quark, by the way, has a charge of two-thirds of the elementary charge. The down quark is negative a third. Those are on your data sheet. But we also have to know about the anti-up anti-quark and the anti-down anti-quark. The anti-up anti-quark would be negative two-thirds. Because remember, an antiparticle is the same except for one property, usually charge. Anti-down would be positive one-third of the elementary charge. And again, those are on your data sheet. You don't need to remember those. Just understand what they mean. Be able to figure out composition. Don't remember the quark composition of a proton. Figure it out. A proton is made up of three quarks. What three quarks are going to give you one elementary charge? Well, let's try up, up, down. Two-thirds two-thirds, negative a third, that gives me one elementary charge. That's a proton. Up, down, down. Two-thirds, 
negative a third, negative a third gives me zero elementary charge. That's a neutron. There's two questions I think it is that I want you to do on this one, on these last couple topics. First of all, it's question 25. And then we'll take a look at uh, one more question when we're done here, and then that'll be it for us. Okay, let's finish this off, okay? Here's the question. If the particles all enter the bubble chamber with identical velocities, and the four statements that are supported by the possible paths shown above are what? Four statements, uh, four, four of these statements that are basically uh, that are basically supported by the observations here. We've got a, a magnetic field that's causing these things to go in circles, right? We've got a magnetic field, and it's the same magnetic field for all of them. And I think it said they went into the same velocity, right? So we want to we see what's different about these. Tell me, what's different about all five of these paths? One thing is different about it. It's not meant to be a hard question that I'm asking you right now. What's different about this versus this? The radius, right? It's the radius. So let's derive an equation to find radius. Fc is equal to Fm. Mv squared over r is equal to QvB. Let's solve for r. It's Mv over QB. All right, take a look here, guys. V is the same for, for all of them. B is the same for all of them. So we're not going to worry about this and this. V and B will affect the radius, but it's not going to affect the radius of of particle u any more than it's going to affect the radius of particle w because it's the same speed and same magnetic field. So what is going to affect the radius of particle u and particle w? Looks like it's going to be the charge, not the charge, not the mass, charge and the mass, right? They both affect it. So we'll say the charge to mass ratio. Particles on path S and W have the same mass. Do they have the same mass? Well, they might, but we don't know that for sure. What we know is that they have the same charge to mass ratio or mass to charge ratio, if you want to think of it that way, right? They have the same charge to mass ratio. So we're going to X that one out. Even though it's possible, we don't know for sure that that's the case. Yes. Yeah, it would. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll deal with that when we get to it, but you're absolutely right there. Um, two, particles on path S and W have the same charge to mass ratio. Yes. I, I'm actually looking at it as mass to charge ratio, but if they have the same mass to charge, it's going to be the same charge to mass, right? Independent of, independent of what the type of charge is, it's the same ratio. Particles on path S and W have opposite natures of charges. Yeah, that's what you're saying, right? Because one of them is deflected upwards, one of them is deflected downwards, they have to have the opposite charges. So two works, same charge to mass ratio, regardless of what type of charge it is, but they also have to have opposite charges. T and U have the same nature of charge. T and U. Yeah, I'd say they have the same nature of charge. We don't know what the value of the charge is, but they're both either positive or negative, so that one seems to work. T and U have the same charge to mass ratio? Definitely not. Because if they have the same charge to mass ratio, they're going to have the same radius. So that doesn't work. T and U have the same mass. Uh, maybe. Maybe. We don't know about that, though, right? We know that the charge to mass ratio is different, but we don't know anything about the charge or the mass specifically. Particles on path V could be neutrons. Why could they be neutrons? Why could the particles on path B be neutrons? Yeah, they're not deflected by the magnetic field. And neutrons, because they're neutral, aren't deflected by the magnetic field. So it doesn't say they are neutrons, but we do know that they're neutral. They could be neutrons because they're neutral. Yeah? Uh, yep. Yep. No, not necessarily. When we say charge to mass ratio, it's independent of the type of charge that they have. So you could find... You would say the charge to mass ratio of, a, of an electron is 1.76 times 10 to the 11. You would say the charge to mass ratio of a positron is 1.76 times 10 to the 11, even though they're opposite charges. The charge to mass ratio would still be the same. So the answer is 2, 3, 4, 7. 
we'd express that right here, two, three, four, seven. All right, last one. Last question that many of you will do with me ever. Question number 26. Give it a look here. All right, let's finish this off. Two types of pions, which we didn't talk about pions. That's okay. I've told you a million times this year. Perfect way to end here, right? A million times this year. If there's a term you don't recognize, it either doesn't matter or they'll explain it. Two types of pions are modeled as is consisting of either a down cork and an anti-up or an up, an up cork and an anti-down. What are the only possible charges for these types of pions? Well, let's look at down and anti-up. Down is negative a third. And anti-up would be negative two-thirds. Okay, look at your data sheet for these charges. They're on there. If we add those up, it gives me negative one times the elementary charge. What about an up and an anti-down? Up cork would be two-thirds. A down would be negative a third. An anti-down would be just positive a third. Again, on your data sheet, if you can't figure that out, we add those up, it gives me plus one times the elementary charge. The answer is C. How many people got it? Good.